Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for staying so late for the last session. So my name is Vishal. And uh, this is the work that I did with my colleagues at EPFL and my advisor, Sanitya. So the work is basically about shipping the critical section instead of shared data. And what we want is basically the locality for shared data in the level one cache. So locks are the most widely used mechanism in the Linux kernel for synchronization. As we can see from this graph, uh, there is a 4x increase in the number of lock API calls that you have in the Linux kernel in the last 20 years. This is because the kernel is uh, moving from coarse grain locking to fine grain locking. So uh, it, it is important for the locks to be scalable. However, we observe that the locks are not really scalable for certain workloads. So here we have a benchmark where it is trying to rename a file in a directory and it is contending on a directory lock. On the x-axis, you have a uh, different number of thread counts. And on the y-axis, you have millions of operations per second. And you can see that the performance decreases as you increase the number of thread counts. Also, the NUMA wear locks like uh, CNA, which was proposed two to three years back, also follows a similar trend. Our evaluation was done on an eight socket Intel machine with 224 cores. So the basic reason for this is the movement of shared data. So here we have three different threads which are trying to acquire the lock. And in this, we have a critical se section that is incrementing a counter. So when thread one transfers the ownership to thread two, the shared data has to move from the level one cache of the thread one to the level one cache of thread two, assuming that all the threads are running on different cores. And when thread two uh, passes the ownership to thread three, the shared data has to move from thread two to thread three. So this movement of shared data adds additional latency in the critical section. Yes. How quick is how quick is the, the how big is the data which gets moved over in uh, uh, the cache line? Uh, how, how many cache lines are you moving? I mean, so, in, in, in most of the cases, if you have, and that's what we strive for, if you have the lock. Uh, and the lock is uh, usually cache where line aligned, and it's at the beginning of the data structure. And then you fit the old, the hot, important data, which is protected by the lock, right behind the lock, so it's in the same cache line. Then it, it, then the, the, the data movement is exactly zero, because you move a full cache line anyway. The lock makes the cache line move. And, and it contains all the data. So, so the question is how much data are you moving? So the shared data here is like one or two cache lines, depending on what you are accessing within a critical section. But one of the other issues with like, the, if you have a Q spin lock kind of design, is that when, uh, when you want to, let's say, when multiple threads are accessing the Q spin lock, you have to do a compare and swap on the uh, tail of the Q spin lock to enter the queue. So even if the, uh, even if when you acquire the lock, you move the lock cache line uh, into, let's say, thread two's level one cache. If other threads accesses the same cache line, then the cache line will go away. So your shared data is anyway gone. No, so it goes from exclusive and shared. Hmm? It goes from exclusive and shared. So it doesn't matter. No, but like when you are modifying the shared data, you have to move yeah, back sure. from exclusive to shared to exclusive. Sure, but that requires extreme high, high contention and short look sections to actually matter. Because because if, if it just moves over uh, because a new contender comes in, then what happens? It goes bounces immediately immediately back, and then the contenders just read and read means shared state. They won't drag it back because that's what we do with the queued spin locks. Okay. That's why we have queued spin locks yeah. because otherwise you would really trying to 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 acquire it and and bounce the exclusive state, yeah. which is expensive. But shared state, bringing it back into shared is completely non-expensive and doesn't affect the lock owner at all. Only if you have a very high number of contenders coming in and you have a very very short um, lock sequence, then it matters because um, it just lock, unlock, lock, unlock, lock, unlock. So there you see the, 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 the actual effect. But if you have reasonably long, long 
sections of of, of lock uh, held uh, code um, plus not not a gazillion of contenders, then it's almost not a problem. The thing is, of course, you, you can kill kill performance with all locks if you throw enough enough contenders on it. I mean, if you have a 256 CPU machine and do 256 uh, threads or yeah. uh, trying to do the same thing uh, yeah. at the sa hammer at the same lock, mm. um, performance will be great. That's not a surprise. But the question is: Is, it, is this a real use case problem, or is it just, oh, we found a way how to expose it. I, I know hundreds of ways to do that, but do they matter? No, because it's not a real world use case. No, but we see performance improvement at 8 and 16, or like uh, less core count also. So because the shared data, like it's not like the share, you can always fit the shared data that you are protecting in the same cache line as a log board. Yeah, so that's if, true. The, if that is not the case, then you have to move the shared data from uh, one core to another core. So yeah, so the increase in shared data movement increases the critical section execution time. And with the spill locks, since you can execute only one critical section at a time, so this increase in critical section time results in lower application performance. So there is an alternative style of uh, lock design, which is called delegation style locks. And here, you uh, it works like a server client model, where you have a server, which is the lock holder. And you have the clients which are waiting to acquire that lock. And the client ships its critical section request in the form of a function to the server thread. So in this example, you have a critical section which is incrementing a counter. And you wrap this critical section as a function and send a function pointer to the server thread for execution. So here, uh, just a pictorial representation of the same thing. So uh, the server thread, when it is processing the client request, it will execute a critical section. And since the shared data is present in the level one cache of the server thread, the execution time of the critical section is much smaller compared to a traditional log design. So here we did the same experiment, but we are measuring the critical section execution time. And as you can see with a delegation style log design, the amount of time you're spending in the critical section is much lower compared to the traditional log design. However, the existing delegation style approaches that were proposed require you to modify the uh, cr uh, critical section and wrap it as a function, which is highly impractical for a, a code base like Linux because it has like uh, millions of lines of code and uh, different constraints as well. So our goal with uh, TC lock was to uh, have transparent delegation and we want transparency so that we can use the standard lock and unlock APIs. And we also want minimal shared data movement of the shared cache lines. So after motivating the problem, uh, I will discuss about the design of TC lock and what it required to change, uh, change TC lock for the Linux kernel and some evaluation and then some discussion on how to uh, further improve it. So to achieve transparent delegation, we need answers for three critical questions. The first is how to capture the thread context without rewriting the whole application. The second is where to capture this thread context so that only the critical section is captured. And the third is, does the waiter thread modify its context while the server is executing the waiter's critical section? So we answer this question and we, uh, the solution is basically to reuse all the registers that you have uh, and you do a context switch. So how to capture the set context is basically like you save and restore all the uh, general purpose registers, the instruction pointer and the stack pointer. So you are moving the thread context just before executing the critical section and just after finishing the critical section. And uh, uh, does the waiter thread modified context? No, because uh, when you when you are when you are a lock waiter, you are just uh, busy waiting to acquire the lock. So during that time, you are not touching your own state. So uh, the lock wait, uh, the waiter thread is not modifying the context. So you can safely transfer the context of the waiter thread to a server core. So putting it all together, so TC lock is basically a cube based design which is similar to key spin lock. 
and all the list of waiters are maintained as a queue. And it supports locking uh, in different contexts, including tasks, IRQ, and NMIs. And there is a server thread that uh, patches each waiter's request. And uh, whoever, uh, whichever thread is at the head of the queue will become the server. And this role will be transferred to the next waiter after some threshold. So currently, we have implemented a counter-based threshold, but we can also have a timer-based threshold. So uh, this is uh, how it works. So you have a queue, and uh, whenever a thread called a lock function, it will do three steps. First, it will save the context, which includes saving the instruction pointer, stack pointer, and general purpose registers. Then you join the queue by doing an exchange operation on the tail pointer. And the thread, which is at the head of the queue, will become the server. So now what the server will do is it will context switch to the uh, first waiter. And then it will execute the critical section of the first waiter. And finally, in the unlock function, what will happen is uh, it will context switch again back to the server thread. And then uh, the server thread will notify the waiter that your critical section is complete. So then the waiter can context switch into its own uh, context, and then it can start executing the non-critical section. Where is the server running? Sorry? Where is the server running? So uh, server is one of the lock waiters. So the first waiter in, the, in this queue will become the server, and the rest will become the clients, which will send the information to the server. So the first waiter in the queue, when it acquires a lock, it will become the server. And then it will process a request from other clients. Uh, um, wait a moment. So the first waiter becomes the server. Yes. So in it, And then five other waiters come in and mm -hmm. throw their requests over. So you basically inflict the work of five other uh, uh, context to the context which happened to be the first waiter. Yeah. And how is that working? How is that supposed to do latency constraints? Not at all. You inflict the whole problem onto the unlucky thread which got the first way, which got to be the first waiter. Yes. So, like, and that's that's really not not acceptable. That can't work because. If you have, especially in the case where you have a lot of a lot of contention coming in, then you slow down this this first poor first victim thread uh, into I can't make progress mode, mm. uh, which might it might it make lose uh, uh, deadlines or whatever it's 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 looking for, and it makes the the, the, the problem way worse, worse for the scheduler because if it's a spin lock you're you're talking about, then it can't even even schedule out while while doing that. Mm. So this is and for for uh, if you want to substitute other lock types like uh, mutexes or something like that, yeah. then it gets even worse because the server can be scheduled out. Mm. So everybody else is going to to to. Uh, uh, to spin, no, it can't. They can't spin. Uh, I mean, they can try to spin, but if the if the the server goes out for lunch, then you have to take put the others to sleep, and you have the same wake up problem with which you have with regular mutexes too. So I'm not convinced. So in, the, that... in the case of mutex, what we do is we check the need rescued uh, using the need rescued. We check whether. Uh, the scheduler wants to kick us out, and in that case, uh, we will pass on the ownership to other thread. So we don't keep the keep the context uh, with uh, locked no, ourselves. No, you can't because if you hold a mutex, you're preemptible by definition. Hmm, yeah. So you 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 don't check need risk yet. Yeah, you, yeah. You're not even asked, hmm. and then you get into another problem because you get scheduled out with the wrong context. Because you switch context in your server. Mm -hmm. So once it schedules out, you schedule out with a context from a foreign from a foreign context. Right? How is that supposed to work? 
without messing up all the Tosk state and everything. I'm not convinced. Okay, so that, that is one of the points that I want to discuss, but the, the current, um, so the context of a thread is defined by the current macro that you have. And currently we don't switch that macro. So when you schedule out the, uh, when, when the server thread is executing the, uh, clients, uh, uh, the clients, uh, critical section, when you schedule out the scheduler thinks that the server thread is being scheduled out and there, uh, there is already the uh, client thread, which, which has gone to sleep because it knows that the server will execute its critical section. So from the scheduler perspective, it is thinking that there is one uh, client thread and one server thread. And it, when it is scheduling out the server thread, it is just scheduling out. It doesn't know about the information that the server thread is executing client thread. So yes, we have to, uh, somehow fix that, but yes. So that is the current implementation that we have. Okay. I'm asking. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. You can, uh, we can give it back to you in a second. So what kind of application are you using to Does it work? Hello? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what kind of application are you using? It doesn't seem like, uh, quite a bit applicable in general. I mean, uh, I'm so that I mean you, you I've seen you publish papers about this. Yeah. So I'm mean, just curious what, what kind of scenarios must be some workload that actually allow this to really allows you to boosting performance. So uh, we observe like performance gains with like will it scale benchmark and also like you have workloads like Metis and these kind of things where uh, uh, level DB uh, where uh, we saw like good performance improvement. So like wherever you have like uh, um, high contention, this will help. But at low contention, we will show that the overhead of context switch negates the performance improvement that you get with keeping the uh, shared data on a sync on in the level one cache. So at two and four, two and four cores, we perform very bad. But like after eight and sixteen cores, once you have enough uh, beta threads, you can uh, bash and you can get perf performance benefit. Uh, I have a question. Um, so the each of the contacts not uh, contain information like all the register. So it, its size will be architecture dependent, right? Yes, but usually and like maybe, in may also be depending on which even within the same architecture, uh, different generation of CPU may have slightly more information you need to keep track of, right? No, so it's uh, it's uh, ISA dependent. So in the ISA, you just need to save like uh, for x86, there are six general purpose registers that you need to save and mm -hmm. plus instruction pointer and stack pointer. So are these contest not um, per CPU variable just like that? Yeah, these are the CPU hard, CPU registers. So yeah. these are the registers that are switched when you context switch from one task to another task. So we are using the same thing. And how big will be the lock itself? So lock is uh, 32 bits. So it's the same as QSpin lock. Okay. Yeah. So because the lock does not need to contain the node, so you have this per CPU node, which is allocated. Uh, yeah. And I, I the that. node will have yeah. like a slightly bigger size. So node size will increase by like one cache line you, because you have to store this information. But the lock itself will not in, increase in size. So the lock itself is 32 bits. thing you you talked about moving large data in in lock in local sections uh, over um, how is this avoiding it I, I don't see that because um, depending on what you're doing inside the locks it, the, the the actual move data which is protected is not that big but but you could copy a, a big chunk of data which is on cpu 4 or even on a on a different number node and then you switch over to the the poor sort who got the who got the server and he has to track uh 16k of data over 
in order to to run the critical section mm -hmm. i mean this is not going to help either so so there's a i mean it looks good on paper but yeah. that, i i think there are very oh, very many open open questions which so, uh, to answer your question we so it's so we have a numa aware policy where you don't transfer the context of a waiter across numa nodes so you only transfer the context of a waiter within a numa node and you pass on the lock ownership to another thread in a different numa node but even if, even on uh, uh, depending on the size of of the data you have to transfer um, within a numa node it's going to be a horror show uh, depending on yeah the, so you have to prefetch, architecture so yeah. let's say within a critical section you are accessing something in the stack then you have to prefetch the stack variables and these kind of things so no 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 in, no in no look at critical sections in the currently especially mutexes or uh, read or write the semaphores or stuff like that hmm. i mean they they do a lot of data movement out of uh out of a local context into some global thing or write in a device or whatever so so you have 32k local data to write out to disk so you have to 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 copy it over from cpu 4 to cpu 1 hmm. and that's going to cross or might cross an l3 boundary but it definitely crosses an l2 boundary yeah which is definitely way slower than if you have to move the stupid cache line over for for the lock itself and the five the five bytes of uh, uh, something which protects the the IO uh, uh, context. So it's you can't generalize this thing because it yeah. massively depends on what the locks are protecting. Yes. So you're completely right about the fact that this probably won't work for all of the cases. But in the case where you know, so the point that you raised before about the latency of a particular request increasing, right? Because you batch everything together in, a, in the context of a single thread. So that thread is paying the cost for everyone else who is trying to execute the critical section. So in that case, if you have a case like that, this is probably not a good idea to use. Similarly, if you're pulling data from other cores inside your critical section, this is probably not a good lock to use. But if you have a case where basically, uh, the same data is being accessed from within the critical section. Uh, this might help with the performance compared to a normal Q spin log or something like that. I'm not completely saying that this is impossible, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm trying to understand uh, what is the actual possible use case, and does it justify the the, the, the complexity? It, uh, what comes with it. I mean, you also have, if you switch the context, you switch basically to the other context stack. That means you operate on the on the foreign stack, which is completely in the other cache line, in the other, in the other L2. So you have to track that over and especially in order to, to do something on the stack on top, push stuff. Or if you have to access something which is deep on the stack, you track that over too. Yeah. So there's there's a there's a, a, a very uh, interesting uh, uh, thing where you where you get a massive negative trade off of that operation, and the larger your data sets get, the worse it the worse it becomes. And the larger your critical sections become, uh, <clears throat> you you have similar problems uh, especially and this is this one or this one concerns me most or not most but it's one of my main concerns is um, that you inflict the latency on the on a random victim yeah uh, how do you do priority inheritance on that the answer is not yeah. <laughs> so, so you're completely right about that uh, that point, but uh, basically, like uh, you could uh, cons uh, construe a case where you have these worker threads, right, which are not in the latency critical path, and which are the preferred waiters that get the ownership of this combining phase. And then everyone who's coming uh, in from the latency critical path trying to take the lock, 
can basically send the request to these threads which are owning the lock and combining it on behalf of everyone else. So uh, uh, you're right about the point about the latency critical part, but there are ways to uh, do that if, if this really applies and helps in a particular situation. So that is what, uh, yeah. Thomas, Thomas, I mean, you have a loud voice. <laughs> not not the problem. So the real real world use case is the is the is the is the critical question. Mm -hmm. But let's continue on on your other issues you you want to demonstrate. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. So let's see what we change in TC log to have it working in the Linux kernel. So we have to handle like uh, whether the waiter thread is really being modified in the Linux kernel or not. What about per CPU variables? How are we handling nested locking? How are we handling out of order unlocking? What about mutexes? And what about readdress semaphore? So let's see how we handle these things. So as I have said that the waiter thread is not modifying in during the context, but there are external events that can modify the waiter's context, like interrupts or whenever you're calling the uh, whenever whenever a thread is going to sleep. So the solution is basically to have an ephemeral stack, which is basically an empty piece of memory, which you switch during the critical section. And then uh, the interrupts and the uh, waiters sleeping and uh, wake up mechanism can use this ephemeral stack. Also, uh, Linux uses a lot of per CPU variables, uh, which, you, uh, which you have to access within the critical section. And the kernel assumes that uh, uh, sometimes uh, per CPU variables need to be stable within the critical section and outside the critical section. But with TC log, since you are moving the critical section to a different CPU, we are breaking that assumption. But is it? So uh, as long as we are running in a certain context uh, within the Linux kernel, we are not breaking that assumption. So in a spin, the spin log code is written in the kernel in such a way that if you run a real-time kernel, all the spin lock will be converted to mutex, especially the spin lock underscore T. So you, if you have to put, if you have to have stable access, you have to use raw spin lock underscore T, or you have to disable uh, IRQs, or you have to disable migration. So we check this condition before running, uh, before uh, running the server thread and the client thread. Otherwise, if this condition is satisfied, then we fall back to Q spin lock. So in our log design, we are doing combining as well as we are uh, keeping the QSpin log the same. For so like in certain contexts, you run QSpin log. In certain contexts, you do combining. Apart from that, like uh, kernel also uses nested locking, where you have like uh, multiple levels of locks. Uh, and uh, in the issue with uh, the uh, the issue with TC lock is that. Uh, when you when you when uh, when the waiter thread completes its critical section, it has to go to the server thread. But now, since you have four different unlock functions, how do you know uh, which server thread to return to? So we use a, a solution similar to the uh, interrupt processing mechanism, where you when you have nested interrupt, when you go to the second level interrupt, you save all the context of the first level interrupt, and then you process the second level interrupt, and then when you go back, you restore the context of the first level interrupt. So here we do the same. So when the first thread, uh, when the first server thread executes and it checks that uh, it is time to execute a nested lock, it will save all of the information that it requires on the stack. And when the nested lock completes, then you can return and then you can restore all the uh, parent server thread and then you can continue. So this is how we are handling nested locking. And this was an interesting one. So I didn't know that uh, Linux kernel also have out of order unlocking. So this is basically means that if you have lock A and lock B, you can unlock the locks in any order. So you can unlock A first or you can unlock B first. And we have seen like multiple examples in the kernel where it is unlocking the locks in different orders. So the issue with uh, TC lock is that uh, here, when you are returning uh, to a server thread, if you uh, return to a server thread with a different unlock function, then uh, you are breaking the uh, assumption that let's say you lock A and lock B and you run a critical section and then you unlock A first 
and then do something and then unlock B. So the code between unlock A and unlock B needs to be protected by uh, the lock B. But uh, in the unlock A, if you return to that function and give the ownership to some other thread, then uh, then the issue is that you're breaking the assumption that uh, the code has written it with. So the solution is basically to track the lock order and you delay the unlocking of that lock until the point that the order is correct. In, so basically the order should be the same as uh, how the lock has been um, lock has been unlocked. Apart from these things, we have also uh, also implemented the mutex. So the difference from a spill lock is that instead of saving the nodes and the state of the uh, server thread on the per CPU variable, we save it in the task struct. And the rest is similar to that what you have in the uh, Linux kernel, except currently we don't support uh, mutex lock interruptible and killable. But, uh, we have to think about how, what we can do to support those things. Otherwise, currently the mutex lock interruptible and killable works the same as mutex lock. How do you, how do you protect the case where I do uh, migrate disable and lock a mutex and then access per CPU variables? It's going to explode. Uh, even the spin lock case is going to explode if you get an NMI because so you you need to, to switch. You would need to switch uh, GS base, basically to the foreign to the foreign per CPU um, information, because that's where the context comes from. Mm. So assume spin lock. The spin lock case is easy. Uh, so you have, or in a context where you have this preemption disabled already, then you access a per CPU variable or get the pointer to it, um, which is. GS based. Okay. So now you lock the lock in that in that data struct and go over to the other side. So you need to then you either need to convert it into a linear address, or how do you do uh, make sure that if the the context function accesses a different per CPU variable that it actually accesses it on the remote CPU. Mm. Because otherwise you modify it on the CPU where the, 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 the server is running and then you get inconsistent state. So the and NMI will explode right away. So in case you have preemption or migration disabled, you wouldn't do the combining. That's the that's the trade off basically if you're calling mutex lock spin lock uh, suppose you're calling spin lock in a context where you have migrate disable at that point the code uh, after that really expects that the per cpu access will be stable right it has already disabled migration so then you don't send over your critical section to the other side you don't have to, you cannot do combining okay cannot combine on any spin lock because a spin lock on a regular non-RT kernel is disabling preemption and you're gone. So and and then you have the the, the issue that the, the per CPU variable access has to be stable. So but so I access so how do you access the 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 remote CPUs per CPU variables? You can't because your chia space is is wrong. If you switch to the other CPU's chia space, you mess up the complete per CPU state. And that, the, 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 the spin lock health section can be interrupted. The spin lock health section can be interrupted by an NMI. You can take whatever other exceptions. And those assume that GS base is local. So it won't work. So the, the so the idea is that uh, uh, so as you said on a, a non RT kernel this will be a spin lock where it disables the preemption so you cannot do this but the same code should work on an RT kernel right so the invariant is that if you're just calling spin lock you cannot assume that preemption is disabled inside the critical section 
So for a normal court path, suppose you're in the task context and you take a spin lock on a non preempt RT configuration, like you, you, you will disable preemption, you'll run on the same CPU, but the same code should work on an RT kernel, right? So as per the API's contract, there's no guarantee that preemption is disabled. The problem I'm trying to describe is you take a spin lock and your context gets migrated from CPU one to CPU zero. Yeah. So then the function runs and does a, this CPU read. Yeah. So which CPUs per CPU variable is it reading? CPU the, zeros or CPU ones? So if, if it does get combined, then it will read the remote CPUs uh, data. But, but whenever you're doing per CPU access, you do disable preemption, migration, etc. Okay. Right, you have a you have a spin lock. We yeah. talk about non RT kernel; it disables preemption. Yeah. This spin lock transfers the context over to 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 some other CPU from CPU one to yeah. CPU zero. Yeah. Then the function runs, and the function does it, this CPU read. Then re, does it read from CPU zero or from CPU one? So it reads from CPU one. Where it is it run? Uh, like because uh, like when you're doing the spin lock call right at that at that very moment there is no guarantee that you'll keep running on cpu zero right you could be pre uh, scheduled out and run on some other cpu no. like before and after the call right inside the critical section like the preemption is disabled on a non rt kernel but right. before that it's not disabled the 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 api but, contract of spin lock how do you read you run in the critical section on yeah. cpu zero yeah you call that function, uh -huh. which does a this CPU read. So how do you read the this CPU, the per CPU we, variable on CPU one? We don't, we don't. We read it as if you're executing on CPU one, because in some sense that thread has to run on. It has to read from CPU one. You CPU one is the one uh, like it's, 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 it's the one which queued it. Okay. And you have the server running on zero. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And now you run the Oh, function. I see. I was confused about CPU. I thought, yeah, no. okay. Zero is the, is the server. Yeah. One is the, the, the it, contender. Yeah. It ships the context and the function pointer. Now okay. the function pointer is executed and it does mm -hmm. this CPU read. Yeah. So how do you make sure that you read the data from CPU one? We don't. don't. We read data from CPU zero. Wrong. Okay. Wrong. But and you but, can't fix that problem. Okay, but we'll probably try to explain you why we think it's right in the hallway. So I no, hope. No, but, yeah. But this is a serious problem, and it can't. Yes. Uh, it's unfixable. Yeah, yeah, but but we'll try to explain why we think it's correct in for the specific case we're talking about after the talk. It might be correct for a particular use case. No, no, but I was going to actually just say the use case. When you're saying the use case that you're saying, which I agree is, is would blow up. But uh, the problem is, I'm thinking, where do we have it where you were doing per CPU variables and you have a spin lock and contention on multiple CPUs for per CPU variables? Usually, no, when no, we're, no, we're, we're usually when we like, like which yes. No, uh, for my. From what I can see, uh, there are a lot of critical section that one call not just to on the protected data. They also want some use some auxiliary data from elsewhere. Not they are not supposed to be protected, and those auxiliary data can contain per CPU variable. Right, that's opening up the CPU. Yeah, because you you have, you have per CPU. You have per CPU data and you want to write that into or transfer that into some global queue or something. Yeah. So you need the lock, which is global, and then you, need, you rely on your per CPU data being stable. So, but if you run on per C, uh, if you ship it over from one to zero and zero looks at CPU da data as zero, then the whole state is confused. So that's, I mean, that's just, I'm looking at it from semantic points, uh, point of view and that for, not from, oh, we made it work for a particular use case. So, so what you're saying is completely correct, but the way we make it work 
we'll try to explain it to you after the talk once this is over or probably in the q and a yeah if we have time for if we have yeah. five minutes okay i will just skip this let's go to some evaluation numbers so here it's the same benchmark that we had and uh, we had like a lower critical section execution time and we have like better throughput because the critical section execution time is lower and at two and four cores, we are losing performance because of the overhead of uh, context switch. But at as you have like more waiters that are contending on the same lock, then you uh, then TC lock shines and then it has like better performance. And also like we did a, a small nano benchmark where you have a hash table and you are uh, each thread is updating and entering the hash table and it is serialized by a global spin lock. And we can see that the throughput is increasing after like eight or 16 cores. And the 99 percentile latency is also decreasing because every critical section that you execute is smaller. So the overall latency to execute will be faster. So it's uh, so uh, ba batching is helping in this case because the crit you cannot execute a, a critical section in parallel. You have to execute critical section sequentially. So if you can reduce the time you are spending in the critical section, the overall latency will improve. Average latency. Huh? The average latency might improve, right? Oh, this is the 99 percentile. So like if you have, let's say, a high batching count, the worst case latency will uh, increase, but the 99 percentile latency will decrease. Because only one thread will suffer out of like let's say a million requests. Sure, I I, I agree with that. But uh, there are people who are concerned about worst case latencies very well. I agree. Yeah, but I think the Linux also does not guarantee the worst case latencies for QSpin logo. Ask networking people; they <laughs> okay. are very concerned about that. Okay. Yes. So yeah. So so that was the. Um, first question for discussion, how do you set the batch count? So basically there is a trade off between throughput and latency. Second is like how to handle like performance regression that you have at low contention at basically at two and four cores. So with TC lock, we have shown that you can have combining and QSpin lock in the same uh, lock mechanism. So uh, we are also working on like having different lock mechanism, which you can switch on the fly based on what uh, whatever contention you have. So you can have like a test instant lock, a Q spin lock, a combining delegation or something else, basically running inside a kernel and they are switching dynamically. And also currently, like um, as you have seen, when the server thread is running, it is executing different waiters critical section. So the server thread is eating up its own uh, time slice. Uh, to like make uh, like because it is executing like waiters critical section. So how do you do like correct accounting for this? So this is a similar problem that you have for interprocessing, but we we also have to fix it for TC lock. And also there is one more issue of the current macro. So basically, how do you uh, uh, how how do you fix this? Uh, current uh, current macro so when you are running on the server thread you have one current and when you are running on another thread you have another current so when you move the critical section to the server thread if you are using the server's server's current then it can lead to privilege isolation or the kind of bugs funny enough current is a per cpu variable mm. okay <laughs> okay yeah so yeah that, that's it <laughs> from I, there. I was just waiting for this slide <laughs> okay <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. I think we're out of time. Thank you for this talk. I mean, you got first-hand feedback and discussion, yeah. live running commentary. Excellent. <laughs>